The scripture reading this morning is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoice. Rejoice, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he, that is David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that is the anointed one, the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Be saved from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Our theme for this morning, as it was on the last Lord's Day and the one before that, is the sermon Peter preached to the astonished crowds on Pentecost. Peter's sermon unfolds in four stages. First, he identifies the proclamation of the gospel in many languages that has startled the crowds as a fulfillment the prophecy of Joel 2, 28 through 32. Second, Peter explains why God chooses to fulfill that prophecy on the morning of Pentecost in AD 33. God, Peter indicates, fulfills Joel's prophecy to call the people's attention to the resurrection of the Messiah, whom they, through their leaders, had crucified. Third, Peter explains that God predicts the resurrection of the Messiah in Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, and Psalm 110, 1, and thereby authenticates his claim that the crucified and risen Jesus, whom he proclaims, is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. Then fourth and finally, Peter explains how human beings should respond to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now we discussed the first segment of Peter's sermon two weeks ago and saw that Peter appropriated what might seem to contemporary readers surreally apocalyptic language to describe a breakthrough in the history of redemption namely the proclamation of the gospel in many languages with which the post-ascension church's mission to all nations and not merely to the Jewish people began. In the second segment of Peter's sermon, which we discussed last week, Peter explains that God chooses to fulfill Joel 2, 28 through 32 on that Pentecost because Jesus, whom the Jewish people crucified, had risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and received from his Father the promise of the Spirit. On that Pentecost morning, Peter explains, the Lord Jesus Christ was pouring out the Holy Spirit promised on the church before the crowd's eyes. Paul affirms this most explicitly in Acts 2.33, where he says, that Peter affirms this most explicitly in Acts 2.33, when he says the following about Jesus. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Today it is time to address the third segment of Peter's sermon. Because the third segment presupposes and follows from the second, on which we preached last week, I'd like to read that second segment, Acts 2, verses 22 through 24, first today. Here Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter then draws on the Old Testament to confirm what he just said by explaining in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 36. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he, that is David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Of the Christ, excuse me, that is, the anointed one, the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel, therefore, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I want you to focus in particular on Peter's interpretation of Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, in which David writes, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter observes in Acts 2.29 that what David says, although he might appear to be speaking about himself, does not correspond with what Peter and the audience know about David's death and the fate of David's body after death. Peter says in Acts 2.29 specifically, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence this day about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us even now. 
by speaking thus, Peter informs the audience that God did abandon David's soul to Hades. That God did allow David's soul to see corruption, David's body to see corruption. Peter reasons, therefore, that when David says in Psalm 16:10, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption, David must not be speaking in his own voice. Looking back at what David said in the light of Jesus' resurrection, Peter realizes that what David says isn't true of David, but is true of Jesus. Peter concludes accordingly that the Holy Spirit inspired David to speak prophetically about the resurrection of the Messiah, David's descendant, who, is re who would reign as king over God's people forever. As Peter explains in Acts chapter 2, verses 30 through 31, being therefore a prophet, and Peter is referring here to David, who, like his descendant Jesus, is not only a king, but also a prophet as well. In Acts 2, 30 through 31, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He, that is David, foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, who is the anointed one, the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Here Peter shows that an Old Testament prophecy, which appears to be patently false, makes perfect sense once we realize that its subject is Jesus. Once we understand that in Psalm 1610, David is speaking about Jesus, we can see not only that the prophecy of Psalm 1610 makes sense, but also that God fulfilled David's prophecy in Psalm 1610 by raising Jesus from the dead 50 days before the day of Pentecost in AD 33. After observing that David predicted the Lord's resurrection in Psalm 1610, Peter elaborates in Acts chapter 2, verses 32 through 36, by showing that Jesus fulfilled another prediction the Holy Spirit made through David in Psalm 110.1. In Acts chapter 2, Verses 32 through 36, specifically, Peter says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. Again, identifying the Lord to whom Yahweh says in Psalm 110, verse 1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, as David does not 
make sense. For as Jesus observes in Luke 22, verse 44, David calls the David calls the Lord whom Yahweh addresses his, that is, David's Lord. Let us place what Jesus says about one, Psalm 110, verse 1, in context by quoting Jesus' words in Luke 22, verses 41 through 44. Here Jesus says, How can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? Jesus shows that Psalm 110 verse 1 makes no sense if one identifies the Lord whom Yahweh addresses in that verse is David. It makes excellent sense, however, if one identifies the Lord whom Yahweh addresses as Jesus. Now, for centuries, Jewish, Jewish exegetes Every, an exegete is someone who interprets the Bible, who engages in biblical exegesis, is unfor, unfolding its meaning. For centuries, Jewish exegetes have responded to Jesus' interpretation of Psalm 110, verse 1, by postulating that one should construe the Hebrew La David means more in Psalm 110, verse 1, not as a psalm by David, which is how Jesus clearly understood those words, but as a psalm about David. If one takes Psalm 110 to be a psalm not by David, but a psalm about David, which other persons other than David pronounce the Jewish exegetes in question allege. There is nothing absurd about the Lord whom Yahweh addresses being absurd about the notion that the Lord whom Yahweh addresses is David. God in his wisdom, however, placed on the lips of Peter already in AD 33 an answer to that argument. And God answered that argument in advance through the Apostle Peter. For in Acts chapter 2, verses 34 through 35, Peter says, David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, this is in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter's point is that David isn't sitting at God's right hand, but Jesus is. Peter establishes, therefore, that even if La David Mizmor meant a psalm about David rather than a psalm by David, Psalm 110, verse 1, would still make sense only if the Lord addressed by Yahweh is the Lord Jesus Christ. For David is not sitting at God's right hand. Jesus, however, is. Now, please, please understand that Psalm 110, verse 1, is not an isolated case. The Old Testament is full of passages that make little sense if one doesn't take what the New Testament says about Jesus into account. 
into account, yes, that make little sense if one doesn't take what the New Testament says about Jesus into account, but passages that make perfect sense when one does take what the New Testament says about Jesus into account when interpreting them. Consider, for example, Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, which the author of Hebrews quotes in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, the word translated as God three times in Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, is Elohim, which is sometimes used in the sense of gods in the Old Testament. But when it is applied to one being, and the reader Yes, and the reader is meant to understand the plural form of the noun as a plural of majesty rather than a numerical plural. Then the word Elohim always denotes the one true God. What I'm trying to say is it, in all three times when we read the word God, in Psalm 45, 6 through 7. It's referring to God properly, not God in some lesser sense, as a mere human being might be. God the Son, yes, if you take what the New Testament says about Jesus into account when reading Psalm 45, verses 6 through 7, it makes excellent sense God the Son is God no less than the Father and the Holy Spirit and thus entitled to be called God in the most exalted sense of that term. Yet God the Son, for the salvation of sinners like you and me, also assumed a human nature in the man Jesus so that in his human nature he is a creature as you and I are. It makes sense, therefore, for Scripture to refer to Jesus, excuse me, Scripture to refer to God as the Son's God and to speak of God's anointing the Son with the oil of gladness, although in his divine nature, God the Son can receive nothing because he already possesses everything. Consider also Zechariah 12.10 where God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me whom they have so that when they look on me, whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. Listen to that one more time. Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. If one takes the incarnation of God the Son in the man Jesus into account. That passage makes complete sense. By assuming a human nature in the man Jesus, 
God rendered himself such that in that human nature he could be pierced, such that he could not only be pierced in fact, but crucified. Hence, Paul speaks in Acts 28, verse 20, of the church which God purchased with his own blood. The Old Testament, all of whose books were written hundreds of years before Jesus' conception in Mary's womb, whose oldest books were written more than a thousand years before Jesus' conception, make sense only when read in light of Christ. That in itself constitutes irrefragable proof that our faith is true. Please, therefore, read the Bible. Hear Christ when he says in Mark 1.15, Repent and believe the gospel. Hear Christ when he says in John 7, verses 37-38, if any one thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You may lose your faith. You may, you, you may lose your life for your faith in Christ. But you will never have reason to regret your decision to trust in him. Come and drink of the spiritual water, the Holy Spirit that the Lord Jesus gives. Let us pray. Please, O oh God, convict us of our sins and drive us to place all of our trust for our salvation in Christ alone. Please impute our sins to him, impute his righteousness to us. And please fill us with the Holy Spirit. Make us a new creation. Please let us taste that living water which only he can give Please, O oh God, unite us by faith to your Son, Jesus. Please, let us die to ourselves and die to the world and live to him. Make us everything we should be in him. And please use the rest of your life the rest of our lives from this moment forward to bring you abundant glory through consistent obedience to your commands and continual praise of your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.